to of a message that I started several weeks ago called Those and the Beloved. Can you turn the volume down just a titch, please? Those and the Beloved. I want you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, in the New Testament. Ephesians, chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 3 through 6, and then we're going to drop down to verses 11 through 13. This is part 2 of a message entitled, Those in the Beloved. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse number 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and notice, in Christ. I've emphasized that to you last week, or several weeks ago. According as He has chosen us, notice again, in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us, predetermined us, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Now drop right down to verse 11, and we're going to read right through to verse 13. In whom also we have, that is, in Christ the Beloved, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. You ought to circle that and underline that because a lot of folks who believe in predestination seem to very casually miss this. That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. And verse number 13, in whom ye also trusted after, notice he says, not before, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Father in heaven, as we study this subject today, those in the beloved, Father, we're asking for an anointing today, that you'd anoint the word, Father, that you'd open up our hearts. And Father, I pray that you'd make this real to us. Jesus would be real in our hearts. The Spirit of God would be upon us. And Father, you'd grant us the understanding. Anoint this preacher with feet of clay. Strengthen this flesh this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, Amen, and you may be seated. I want to give you a brief overview of part one of my message, Those in the Beloved, that I preached several weeks ago. And, beloved, in that we learned about the word predestinated. Pro orinzo is the Greek word. And it simply means to decree or determine beforehand. And we saw how God, in the four ordinate councils, before the foundation of the world, predestinated two corporate groups or two corporate classes of people in his redemptive plan to either go to heaven or to go to hell. Now the whosoever wills, that is those who trusted in Christ as their Lord and Savior, would be supernaturally regenerated by the Holy Spirit, they would be adopted into the family of God, and these are the folks that would go to heaven. Would you say amen out there? They're the whosoever wills, but also in God's plan there was the whosoever wants. And those are those who would reject the Lord as their Lord and Savior and would go to hell. Now, beloved, a lot of people believe with their head that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. I believe that as when I was a Catholic. If you ever said to me, I can't remember a day that I didn't pray, uh, is Jesus Lord and Savior? Absolutely. Of course, I didn't have a clue what Jesus meant when he said I must be born again for it to drop into my heart. And so, but we're talking, I'm talking this morning as if you already understand that I'm speaking to born-again people or about born-again people. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, we learned that God capriciously and arbitrarily predestinated the redemptive plan and not the man. That's important that you understand that. In other words, we saw that God created man as a free moral agent and he poured out his prevenient grace. Now, beloved, that word prevenient is a theological term. It simply means his anticipatory grace. In other words, we couldn't move our wills unless God did, took the initiative, and I'll talk more about that later as I go along. But poured out his 
prevenient or anticipated, uh, anticipatory grace upon him to give him the power to be able to move his heart, to move his will, to give him the ability to either choose and accept the Lord Jesus as her Savior or to make the choice to damn or reject and be damned by the Lord. Now, God doesn't want him to be damned. We studied about that. But that's a choice every person has to make. Jesus said, ye must be born again. Amen. Acts 4, 12, I always tell you, neither is there salvation in the other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby, this is what he says, Peter's talking, we must be saved. Amen. It is absolutely dogmatic, emphatic, if you ever want to grace the doors of God's heaven. This gospel going around today that everybody's going to heaven, that God's a bearded old man and he don't care if you accept him or reject him and do what you want. As long as you're religious, you're going to heaven. Well, beloved, that's a lie right out of the pit of hell. It even smells like smoke. It's totally contrary to the infallible word of God. Would you say amen out there? So don't believe that. So I'm, what am I saying to you? I'm saying God did not capriciously and arbitrarily determine beforehand to either save or or damn any person to go to heaven or hell without their individual say or choice in the matter, contrary to what the Calvinists believe or what the monergists believe. Now, that's another theological term, but that's what that means. Calvinism is known as monergism. Say that word. Monergism. It's important that you understand that. That's what they heretically believe, and that's what they heretically teach. We saw how God wants all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Amen? And we saw, beloved, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we also saw that God invites whosoever will to believe the gospel and be saved, and he warns the whosoever wokes that if you reject the gospel, if you do not get born again, you are going to go straight to hell. And God does not want that. But he warns men about that. That's why he sent his son, because of his infinite love for us. Would you say amen out there? And so therefore, beloved, the scripture clearly teaches what we know as synergism, not monergism, synergism. You know when you synergistically put something together, you commingle something together. What does that mean? Does it mean that we do a little bit and God does a little bit, we're saved? No, God has done it all. However, beloved, in accordance with God's redemptive plan, it means that man through faith must choose to accept or cooperate with God's spirit, cooperate with God's grace and the gospel to save his soul, or not cooperate with it and resist God and ultimately reject God and damn his soul. Now listen, beloved, not rejecting the God that you've contrived in your mind Contri uh, rejecting the God of the Bible. A lot of people have a God that they've made up in their own mind. You've heard people say, I believe in the man upstairs. That shows you immediately they don't have a clue who the man upstairs really is. You'd never say that if you were born again, amen? Or oh, they'll say, me and God have this understanding. Well, beloved, that goes to show you or me that you have no understanding of what the scripture says or what Jesus taught whatsoever, amen? Otherwise, you'd never make such a foolish and unbiblical statement as that. So we see that God had left the final decision up to each and every individual person, beloved, as to what group that they wanted to belong to, that God had predestinated. I told you, the whosoever wills, whoever joined that group, they're going to go to heaven. The whosoever wants who join that group, they're going to go to hell. It's the plan, not the man who's been predestinated and decreed. Would you say amen out there? So you must decide to either cooperate with God and go to heaven or resist him. And of course, and I hate to say this without tears in my heart, go straight to hell. No one spoke about hell more than the Lord Jesus Christ did. Jesus said that the fire of hell never goes out. It's unquenchable. You don't think God would have bankrupted heaven and sent his only begotten son to die on the cross if there was no such thing as hell, do you? Of course not, beloved. So there's a, truly a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Now, you don't hear too many people speaking about that. So we talked about that, what predestination and God's eternal decree was about. We also learned that all of God's superabundant blessings, benefits, and bounties that come to us believers are, quote, unquote, in Christ. I told you to circle that in your Bible. And we saw how we get into Christ is by grace through faith and repentance at 
baptism. Now listen to me, not infant baptism, because you have to be able to make a decision for yourself whether to accept or reject the gospel. Amen? Infant baptism is a man-made doctrine. It does not have any place in Scripture whatsoever. In fact, beloved, even those denominations that teach that will tell you there's no Scripture that really says that, but tradition has said, well, I'm not going to base my soul and eternity on tradition. How about you? I'm going to base it on what God has to say. Uh, could somebody close that, that, that curtain right there, that's, that's sunshine right off a window, right into my eyes, and I've got enough glory on me right now. <laughs> right. No, it's blinding me, to be honest with you. So we saw that the sacrament of baptism is the consummation and it is the demonstration of our faith and repentance when the Holy Spirit now inwardly and simultaneously baptizes us into the body, bride, and building of Christ, which is the church, beloved, and we're adopted into the family of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Baptism is when we now spiritually participate in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism is when, when we now identify with the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 6 it says that at baptism is when we are incorporated into the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and we share in both the tragedy and the triumph of the cross with Christ as our Lord and Savior. Would you say amen out there? So beloved, baptism is the only thing, now listen to me, this is important, and I want this to get on the, the people that are buying the DVDs and watching us on TV and everything else. This is important that you understand this. Baptism is the only thing in all of the Bible, beloved, the only thing that bears the divine signature of all three members of the Godhead. Baptism is the only thing that bears the divine endorsement and imprimatur of all three uh, members of the Godhead. Baptism is the only thing that bears a divine name, that is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the most blessed Holy Trinity in uni, unity upon a person, beloved, and guarantees them of their salvation and eternal life in the kingdom of God. Would you say amen out there? People say it's just a symbol. It's just a symbol? What else gives you the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God upon you? So you need to study your Bible and stop listening to what people have to say. Would you say amen out there? And it guarantees you someday you'll live in a new heaven and a new earth. And Peter says, hallelujah, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Come on and say amen out there. Now remember this, beloved. We are not saved by baptism alone. That's important that you understand that. But by grace through faith and repentance at baptism after we have believed the gospel and trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior. If we do not believe the gospel, if we do not repent of our sins, and then we go and get baptized, we'll go into the waters a wet sinner and we'll come out, I mean a dry sinner, and we'll come out a wet sinner. So you just can't say, well, I'll just go get baptized, but I won't repent of my sins, I won't get born again, I won't get regenerated by the Holy Ghost, I just want to get baptized. It doesn't work that way. Baptism alone won't do anything for you, nothing whatsoever, amen? And so people say, I just want to do that. Uh-uh. You've got to repent and believe the gospel. You've got to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, I want you to look at verse number three. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, he says, in heavenly places. And notice he says, in Christ, and we got into into Christ, how? By grace, through faith and repentance, at what? Baptism, that's how the Holy Spirit placed us into the body of Christ. Now, beloved, I want you to know three of these rich spiritual blessings, benefits, and bounties in heavenly places that are found in Christ. This is where I left off on part number one. In Him, we've been, number one, accepted in the Beloved. Let me say that again. In Him, we have been accepted in the Beloved. Now listen to me now. Men have been rejected by God. But in Him, we have now been what? Accepted in the Beloved. I want you to look at verse number 6. 
He says, so the praise of the glory of his grace, this is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, for you folks watching by television, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now that word accepted is the Greek word karito. We get our word charis. A lot of people say charis. So, okay, that's a simple Greek word for, for uh, grace. It's charis, say it. Charis, okay. Here it means to be highly favored by God. Here it means to be uh, given and endued with special approval and kindness by God. Here it means to be the unworthy, albeit blessed recipient of a close and an intimate personal relationship with God, freely given to those in Christ through the divine, unmerited grace of God. Would you say amen? Why is that, preacher? Because Christ is the uniquely beloved of God. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the uniquely only begotten of God. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, listen to me now, is the blessed and eternal Son of God. I debated with a pastor last week when I left, it almost kill me. After I got through preaching and counseling, then I had to debate this pastor, and I did it for three days in a row, beloved. It took everything I had in me. Honestly, I haven't recovered since. When you've been on and on and on and on, but he didn't believe in the Trinity of God. He didn't believe that Jesus was the eternal Son of God. He was just the Son of God when he came into the world. And so that's so important that we believe that Jesus Christ is the eternal, only begotten Son of God. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, the Father, our Heavenly Father, the Father's intimate and infinite relationship with the Son is one of extraordinary and incomparable love. I'm saying it's a divine love that is unfathomable. It is a divine love that is immeasurable. It is a divine love that's incalculable. It's inviolable, beloved, and it is unsurpassable. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying we must never, ever, ever lose sight of that truth, how much God loves his son. That's why I've told you that God will not allow any person to trample the blood of Christ underfoot, especially once they made a profession of Christ and started walking away from him. Now, you would not allow that even in your child if they were disobedient. Amen? Can you imagine God with his perfectly obedient son? He will not let anybody defile the cross, anyone defile his son. Come on and say amen out there. In other words, what we need to do is look at the scriptures through the eyes of God and not through our own eyes. We need to hear what God has to say about it, not what you have to say about it or what you think about it. Drives me crazy. Well, you know the way I think, people say, I don't care what you think. What does the Word of God say? And I'll tell you what it says. It says that God loves more, the love Jesus, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, more than anything. In other words, beloved, there's no one and nothing that the Father loves more than the Son. Would you say amen out there? No one is more pleasing. No one is more preferred by God than the Son. In Hebrews 1.3, the Bible says that he is the brightness of his glory, the express image, the very imprint of God himself. And in him, Paul says, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Would you say amen out there? As the Father said, he was God of very God, light of very light, truth of very truth. Come on and say amen out there. We can't put aside this historic, orthodox, Christian faith that has been passed down to us. We need to defend it. And that's what Paul did, and that's what this preacher has been trying to do from this pulpit for the last 40-something years. Let's try to defend the faith that you and I believe so we can pass it on to our children and pass it on to our grandchildren. Would you say amen out there? Therefore, beloved, what I'm saying is this. If God will do anything for anyone, God will do it for his beloved son. Would you say amen, beloved? Listen to me. There is nothing, nothing the Father will withhold from the Son. Now listen to me very carefully. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, the Bible says this. When you got baptized, he says, For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Let me say that again. He says, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, the heaven of heavens can't contain this God. Amen. That's what the scripture says, doesn't it? 
But God says, through Christ, your life is now hid where? He's hid in this God. Beloved, did you hear that? We died and resurrected with Christ at baptism, and then we were hidden away in God the Father for nice shelter and security. Would you say amen out there? When I say we, I mean those who have placed and kept their faith in the Lord Jesus. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, to be accepted in the beloved also means, and it is synonymous with, our being dead and our life being hid with Christ in God. Ergo, if Christ is the ultimate beloved of God, this now means that we are also securely tucked away and safely hid with Christ in heaven right now in the very bosom of the Father with the Son, would you say amen? We're tucked away in the bosom of the Father. Beloved, now there's nothing God won't do for those in Christ the Beloved. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 32, the Apostle Paul said to the church at Rome, this is what he said, he said that he that spared not his own Son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us, that is, who believe, all things? Do you hear that? He that spared not his son, but delivered him up for you and for you and for you and for anyone who placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. He says, how shall he not with him also freely give you a few things? No, that's not what he said, did he? He said he'll give you all things. Now, beloved, even though we're not yet personally perfect, and even though we're not yet personally sinless or flawless in Christ, the most beloved of God, positionally, now say that word. This is theological, beloved, but that's why God's people don't know too much about predestination and what the Scriptures teach. They need to hear some theological terms. Though we are not yet sinless or perfect or flawless, but in Christ the Beloved, positionally, what? Positionally, we who have placed our faith in Christ, we who have kept our faith in Him, are now seen just like that in Christ. God sees us as being perfect, and He sees us as being sinless, and He sees us as being flawless because we are hid with Christ in the bosom of the Father. Come on and say amen out there. You see, beloved, when I teach my seminary students, this is high Christology. What is it? High Christology, the study of the Lord Jesus Christ, which more cemeteries, excuse me, seminaries would be, uh, think well to do right now instead of what's going on. Oh, hear me now. God, the Bible teaches, is the divine fount. He's the fountainhead of all of the rich spiritual blessings in heavenly places to man. He's, uh, but the Father has made His beloved Son not only to be the Messiah and the mediator, but listen to me now. The Father has made the beloved Son to also be the medium, to be the spiritual channel, to be the funnel, if you will, through which all of these rich spiritual blessings from heaven will come to you and will flow to you, not only throughout the course of your life when you live on the top side of this earth, but blessed be God throughout all eternity. Come on and say amen out there. For all eternity, all the blessings that God gave Christ He's going to give to you and they're all going to go through Him just like water through a funnel. Why? Because of our perfect uh, because of our union and communion with His Son through faith at our baptism. Why, preacher? Because of our incorporation into and identification with His Son through faith at baptism. Why is that, preacher? Because of our hidden new life. Did you hear what I said? Because of our hidden new life in the bosom of the Father with His Son through faith at baptism. So now... We have an inviolable guarantee by God uh, that we've been accepted in the Beloved. Despite <laughs> all of our moral and spiritual flaws and faults and foibles. Amen? Because that's what Satan tries to get us to focus on. Because even though we've got the Holy Spirit inside of us and we have a new nature, we still got the flesh and the old nature that we have to contend with. Amen? I love the song, He's still working on me. To make me what I ought to be, right? Is he still working on you? He's going to work on you, Tom, for all eternity. He told me last night. 
But you see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I was saying that because of that, he'll not reject us. Because of that, he'll not discard us. Because of that, he'll not cast us off like we're some type of moral and spiritual outcast or pariah or prodigal son in his sight. Instead, God assures all of us, unworthy and undeserving folks uh, that are in Christ, that we're still the most gracious and blessed recipient and heirs of his rich spiritual blessings in heavenly places, ladies and gentlemen, because we've been accepted by him because of our faith in him. Would you say amen out there? Now get this, beloved. God did not accept us because of our own goodness or greatness. You ask a person, you going to heaven? Yes. Why? Well, I'm a good person. You know, God says to us, there's none good. You don't like that. I didn't. Remember when the rich young man came up to Jesus? He said, good master. God, Jesus looked at him and said, what? There is none good but God. Why did he say that? He was saying without saying it, are you calling me God? If you're calling me good, then you must ergo believe that I'm what? That I am God in the flesh. Come on and say amen out there. And God did not accept us because of our own holiness or righteousness, because all our righteousness we know are as filthy rags, the Bible says. And God did not accept us because of our own decency or morality. God only accepts us because we, through faith, accepted Christ, the Son of His love, as our Lord and Savior at baptism, and then we were supernaturally immersed in God and have consequently now also been made the sons of His love in Christ. Christ was the son of His love, but now when we accepted Jesus, we have become the sons of His love. Would you say amen out there? Oh, I hope you leave here today rejoicing and jumping up and clicking your heels. If you can't, lay down and click them. But click them. <laughs> you ought to rejoice. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, God made him. God made him, the beloved one, to be our blessed kinsman redeemer, our uh, and divine vehicle and vessel through which he's chosen to show all mankind that we Christians are the loved and adored beneficiaries of the spiritual riches of his glory and grace. You know, the unsaved world partakes of some of God's grace. God feeds them. God clothes them. God heals them when they go to the hospital. Yet very few people thank God for that, by the way. God gives them a job. God gives them the roof over their head, clothes them. But they don't thank God for that. The Bible warns that they don't do that. They think they're doing it themselves. But it's God and His goodness. The goodness of God, Paul says in Romans 2, 4, is to lead us under repentance. And so we can step back and reflect and say, you know what? There must be a God up there. Everything in my life, I'm, I've got food in my belly. I've got money in my pocket. I've got a car in the yard. I've got a roof over my head. Where did it come from? It came from this God. Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, in Him, the Bible says, we have now become sons and saints and servants of God. Think about it. In Him, we have now become members of His body and His bride. In other words, His New Testament ecclesia, His church, His assembly on earth, spread out everywhere throughout the world. We read it this morning in Revelation. And beloved, in Him, we become the heirs of God and joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. God has accepted us in Him and because of Him. Would you say amen out there? That is Jesus because of his moral and spiritual perfections and goodness and not ours. So God says to all of us penitent sinners in Christ, I'll take you even if nobody else on this earth wants you because when you come to my son, you have now been accepted in the beloved. Oh, beloved, listen to me now. God says to the penitent thief, I'll take you. God says to the penitent drunk, I'll take you. God says to the penitent prostitute and the adulterer, I'll take you. Nobody else in society uh, wants to, but I'll take you. God says to the penitent homosexual and transgender, I'll take you. I love you. My son died for you. I'll take you. God says to the penitent drug addict, beloved, he says to all sinners, I'll take you if you'll take my son. Would you say amen out there? Why is that? 
Because now in Christ, my beloved Son, you have become accepted and beloved, and now you also have become the beloved of God, just like Him. Would you say amen out there? So what did we find? Point number one, in Him, we have become the accepted in the beloved. Number two, in Him, we have become the elected in the beloved. I want you to look what he says in verse number four of Ephesians chapter one. According as he hath chosen us in before the foundation of the world. People put a period there. The word that shows you a reason what he's doing here. So he's talking to his plan that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Notice that God has also chosen us, eklego my echo, who believe in Christ for a specific reason and purpose. Why did he chose us? So you and I would be holy, it says, and blameless before him in love. In other words, God says, I not only want to save you, I want to sanctify you. Would you say amen out there? I want to take you from what's secular and profane and put you over here in what is now spiritual, sacred, and holy. Would you say amen out there? That's why the Bible talks about holy men of God. We're moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen? That's why the Bible says the world was not worthy of such people like that. They were filled with the Holy Ghost of God. They were filled with the grace of God. Now, folks, God, according to His redemptive plan, formulated before the foundation of the world, has selected and elected those who place their faith in Christ and now belong to that corporate class, that group of people, the whosoever wills, whom he predestinated and decreed to be saved and become like his son Jesus, to forever be holy before him, him God, and before him in love. Would you say amen out there? Beloved, if God poured out his love to us, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If God poured out his Son to die for you, what's he going to do now that you're living for him? We can't even comprehend that with our fallen human finite minds, can we? Now, beloved, What am I saying to you? I'm saying, consequently, now that we through faith have been baptized into Christ, we alone have become the chosen ones of God to live with Him in the eternal kingdom of God. But I want you to notice that God chose uh, chose us not just to be saved from hell, and that's why people get this so twisted sometimes. He chose us, beloved, to be morally and spiritually and radically changed both inside and out and to make us holy ones because we were once hellish ones. Would you say amen out there? That was the purpose of God, to reach down into the world, into mankind, and take fallen man that was sinful, wicked, evil, and turn him into a saint of God. Would you say amen? That can only be done by the supernatural power of the living God. Why did he do that? I'll tell you why. So you and I could rule and reign with him throughout the universe with his son Jesus someday. Amen? But beloved, I want you to notice here that the predestinated and decreed purpose and reason in God's redemptive plan as to why he has elected and selected us who through faith have trusted in Christ as our Lord and Savior and have been baptized into Christ. In Christ... God, I told you, has chosen us to be saved and sanctified. But listen to me now. He's not only chose you to be saved and sanctified, but he's chose you to be justified and glorified. If you're not justified, if Christ did not die for you, you have no mediator in heaven. You have no advocate with the Father in heaven. Amen? You've got no one to plead your case in heaven. You're going to stand before God, you and him. But if you've accepted Jesus, beloved... Jesus kind of steps in. Here's God. You're behind him. And Jesus, uh, God says, uh, where's Joel? He's behind me and in me. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> what are you saying to me, preacher? I'm saying God, Christ has chosen us to be conformed and transformed into Christ's moral and spiritual image. This is what God wanted to do from all eternity. This is what God wanted to do with Old Testament Israel. He wanted them to be the witness to the world and be transformed by His grace and by His power. But they failed miserably, I'm sorry to say that. 
But in Christ also God has chosen us to be resurrected physically, not just spiritually, and to be raptured, beloved, and translated to heaven. Think about it. God has chosen us in Christ to be immortalized. He's chosen us to be eternalized, beloved. He's chosen us to be the blessed recipients of all of heaven's love and lavishly poured out spiritual gifts and graces that he just wanted to lavish and pour out upon us and keep on pouring out upon us. In Ephesians 2, we don't have time to go there, but Paul says that God will pour out this grace on us, this lavish grace, this superabundant grace, forever and for all eternity, like chains on a link on a fence, forever and forever and forever and forever. Would you say amen? And God is just going to keep pouring it out in Jesus. Why? Because we now belong to Christ the Beloved, and in God's redemptive plan, Beloved, he chose to make those who trusted in Christ as their Lord and Savior to be holy. And he says, you're going to be blameless before me. And I'm going to love you just like I love my son. How's about that? I'm going to love you just like him. You see, beloved, the moment we were born, God foresaw and foreknew our personal spiritual proclivity. What do I mean by that? The moment that we were born, God saw the proclivity or the bent of our heart. For example, in Romans chapter 9, God says that he loved Jacob, but he hated Esau, or preferred. That's the word. Uh, it's not really hated like you and I would know the word. Why? Because God says when he called in the womb, the only one that listened up was not the older son. It was the who? The younger son. Amen? Amen. So God sees the proclivity, the predisposition of our heart, the bent of our heart, I should say, to, uh, to spiritual things and to believe the gospel and accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. And now, because of that, he goes to work making sure that we become one of his elect. Would you say amen out there? In other words, if I'm going to work with all you folks out here, I'll just use Kung Fu. And nobody's interested. I'm saying, well, look, I can show you this, that, and the other. But Dave says, I am. Who am I going to start working with? I'm going to spend my time, energy, and Dave, this is what you need to do. <laughs> okay? And I'm going to spend all my time, energy, and effort directing it toward Dave because I can see the bent, the proclivity of his heart is toward spiritual, or you know what I'm saying, things like that. <laughs> Kung fu -y. You, you, you always do that with chop suey. See, kung fu and chop suey go together. So. But all that to say, beloved, what am I saying is this. I'm saying, therefore, God in his sovereignty, God in his omniscience, chose us in Christ. He called us in Christ. He converted us and consecrated and changed us in Christ. But how? How does he do it? He does it by His Spirit and grace and through the gospel Then I'll personally become a part of that elect group and class of people that He has already predestinated and decreed beforehand would go to heaven in His redemptive plan when they believed and they would be holy and they would be blameless and they would be the sons of His love. Would you say amen out there? Now hear me. God chose us in Christ because He foresaw foresaw and foreknew that we through faith now also choose him and respond to his divine initiative and invitation in the clarion call of the gospel and get saved. For example, Jesus said this in John 6, 44. Jesus said that no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Now that word draw, hefkuo, means to inwardly compel, impel, to drag to them. When those people who are spiritually minded, when their heart bends towards spiritual things, God by His Spirit and grace not only calls us outwardly through the gospel, but inwardly in our hearts. And He starts yanking us and pulling us. And we want to hear more. Teach me more about this Christ. Teach me more about how I can go to heaven. Teach me more about how I can live forever. See, God starts doing what to us? We don't come kicking and screaming. We come because we love it. Oh, man, this is real. This is unbelievable. Hey, let me ask you a question. The day that you got saved, did this Bible come alive to you? Ah, 
See, the Spirit of God is the one that inspired the Word of God, and now He lives inside of us. And He makes the Word of God come alive in our hearts. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, I want you to note when Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Spirit of God draw him, I want you to note the all-inclusive universal negative in that text. Jesus says, no man can come to me. No Catholic can come to him. No Protestant can come to him. No Muslim can come to him. No one in this world can ever come to God unless God does a work in him first. Would you say amen out there? And beloved, not only that, that all-inclusive universal negative, but I want you to notice the divine supernatural drawing power. He says, except the Father which hath sent me, draw him. It is God taking his hook, so to speak, and casting it out there, and you yanking onto it, and he starts doing what? He's going to reel you in. <laughs> or guppy, he got you. <laughs> Praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying apart from the preliminary and preemptive uh, spiritual work of God on our hearts and in our lives, <clears throat> and the pouring out of His prevenient and preceding grace to divinely enable and empower us to receive and believe the gospel, you and I would be utterly lost. We would not have a chance to ever go to heaven. Now, Scripture is poignantly clear on that, beloved, if you read it. Without God, first taking the divine initiative in our salvation, we would never be saved. We would never be sanctified. We would never ever seek after God and Christ as our Lord and Savior. And moreover, beloved, we would never be holy, we would never be blameless, and we would never be the sons of God's love forever. Unless God elected us. Unless God took the divine initiative. In Romans chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, the Apostle Paul dogmatically and emphatically states, this is what he said, he says, there is none that seeketh, seeketh after God. He says, they have all gone out of the way. There's none that seek after God. They've all gone out of the way. Every man, woman, and child that was seminally in the loins of Adam had fallen from grace. Would you say amen out there? And so, beloved, it is God who first elects the elect, so the elect will then elect him. How does that sound? Oh, think about this, beloved. Think about this high, the Bible says, and holy and heavenly calling and honor the elect have in Christ. Because it's a great mystery, the Bible teaches. We chose him. Why? The Bible says because he first chose us. Listen to me now. Why? Beloved, we love him. Why? Because the Bible says he first loved us. I didn't know how to love God until he came inside me and showed me how to do it. The Bible says that we seek him. Why? Because he first sought us. Would you say amen out there? You know, a lot of people say, where's God? He's looking over to you. He's been calling you from the day you were born. Oh, the blessed mystery of the gospel, of the interaction between God's divine sovereignty and man's human responsibility. Where they overlap, I don't have a clue. Neither does any angel. As King David said, this knowledge is too wonderful for me. I cannot attain, he said. This is way above my pay grade. I, don't, I can't put these things together, but I know both of them are true. So God took the divine initiative, beloved, and he chose us to obtain his salvation, not because he saw any inherent goodness in us, not because he saw any inherent greatness or worth or value in us, because we have none. God chose us because he looked down the card of time in our lives and foresaw and foreknew that we'd accept Christ as our Savior, that we'd choose Him to be our Savior, and God, already, God had already foresaw us in Him according to His plan. Would you say amen? Because this is what He planned to do with everyone. When God chose you and you chose Him, God says, you're in my plan now. And this is what I've got planned for you. So, beloved, that's why God selected us, that's why God elected us, and that's why God chose us to be those in the Beloved. Amen? Now, i got a few more minutes. i got seven minutes left, and I want to give you the third point. We have been accepted in the Beloved. We have been elected in the Beloved. And thirdly, we've been perfected in the Beloved. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 4. Go over a couple pages. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to read verse 8 and then drop down to verses 11 through 13. 
The Bible says in verse 8, and he's quoting here, by the way, the Old Testament. He's quoting Psalm 68. Uh, um, uh, I forget what it was, verse 18 or around there. He says, Wherefore he saith, when he, Messiah, ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. That was the uh, comforted side of Hades, or you know as Hades, okay, and gave gifts unto men. Now here's the gift. Drop down to verses 11 through 13. And he gave some, the Greek literally says, to be apostles, and some to be prophets, and some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Why in the world would God ever give pastors and teachers to the church? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, that we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge, notice what he says here, of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, I want you to note the spiritual diversity of gifts. Now, these gifts are both ordinary gifts, but they're also extraordinary supernatural gifts that Christ gave to his church upon his ascension. Why did he do it? Well, Paul tells us to edify the church, to perfect the church, to build up his church here on earth. Now, the word perfecting is the Greek word kartismos, and it's a present tense verb, and it was used by artisans of that day, meaning it means to constantly and continuously refine. It means to continually hone or improve. It means to continuously polish up till the job that they're working on is totally and superbly complete and has measured up to the standards that they want. Of course, we have the standard we have to meet that God wants, not what we want. Amen? And by the way, that's why Christians kick and shout and, (laughs) you mean I got to do this and I got to do that? God says, for your own good, right? For your own good, yes. Who else is going to give you eternal life? Who else is going to give you a glorified body? Who else is going to give you all eternity? And so it's for your own good. So, beloved, a part of God's redemptive plan is that he predestinated He decreed that those in Christ, the last Adam, would constantly be in the process of being supernaturally changed by his Holy Spirit. We'd continually be in the process of being sanctified and restored by the Holy Spirit. We'd constantly be in the process of being polished up by the Holy Spirit. To what? To the pristine moral and spiritual perfections and glory that we all lost in Adam when he fell. Amen? Adam was perfect and became imperfect. Adam was immortal and he became what? Mortal when he fell. You see, folks, God will not allow those in the beloved that he accepted and elected to not be morally and spiritually perfected, meaning this that throughout the entire course of our life, now listen to me, the triune God will daily be about the business of supernaturally sanctifying you. You'll be in that process of being sanctified. He'll be using all of the situations and problems in your life. He will be using all of the adversities and afflictions in your life. He will be using every trial, every trouble, every tribulation in your life every experience in your life, good, bad, or indifferent. God says, I am going to use that to morally and spiritually teach us his ways. I'm going to use those things to polish you up. God's saying, I'm going to use these things to sand down your rough edges. I'm going to use these things to refine and reform your life and your lips so you're able to live and talk and act just like Jesus Christ, my son. In God's redemptive plan, beloved, he uses the gifts, he says here, of pastors and teachers to predominantly do this. Now, you may not like me, but I'm the pastor that God has called for this church so far. Now, listen to me. That's why verse 12 says, pastors and teachers, that'll be perfecting and edifying the saints. That's why Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4, to the pastor, your pastor Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears and turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. 
That's what's happened in these last days. People have itching ears. I want a smoother gospel. I want an easier gospel. I want everything the world has to offer me and go to heaven to boot. Sorry, can't have it. If you love the world, God said the love of the Father is not in you. Did he say that? He says it everywhere. You see, beloved, God's people need to hear God's word. Amen? The preacher needs to preach God's word, not just story after story or fluff or feel-good things. You're not going to be refined unless you hear the word of God. You're not going to be reformed unless you hear the word of God. Beloved, you're not going to learn how to die to yourself and conform into the image of Christ unless there's a preacher that God has sent to be able to teach you. Amen? Listen to me now. The Apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. He said, it's through the foolishness of preaching that he's going to save and sanctify men. Did you hear that? You're here today to listen to this foolish preacher teach you the Word of God so the Spirit of God can work in the heart, uh, your heart in the, of the people of God and turn you into sons of God. Would you say amen? It's through the foolishness of preaching, he says. My beloved, listen to me. Someday in Christ, our minds will be totally perfected. Amen. Beloved, someday in the Lord Jesus Christ, our bodies will be totally and completely perfect. We'll be resurrected. We'll be glorified. We'll be immortalized. Someday in Christ, beloved, our souls and our spirits and our thoughts and our union and communion with God will be total and it will be complete. And then we'll see God face to face. And the Bible says we will know him even as we are known. In other words, the visio day, the beatific vision, seeing God face to face and all is unveiled and all is undiminished glory. Oh, what a wonderful day that will be. Amen. Now back up to Ephesians chapter 1 again. Ephesians chapter 1, and I'm going to close with this, verses 11 and 12. He says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Those who have trusted in Christ have been predestinated to obtain an eternal inheritance. You know what that means, beloved? We're going to inherit the estate of God. <laughs> Like a rich man would say, son, my houses, my bank accounts, everything I own is now yours. The estate that we're going to get, we're going to share it with the Lord Jesus. Would you say amen out there? Why? Because the Bible says Christ is the captain of our salvation. Why? Because the Bible says Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. Why? As we've been seeing, beloved. Because Christ is the bestower of all God's rich spiritual blessings to us. Even Jonah, way back yonder in the Old Testament, said in Jonah 2.9, that salvation is of the Lord. It's not of man. It is not of Joel. It is not of the church. Salvation is of or comes from the Lord. Would you say amen, Alvea? Making those who believe the gospel to be heirs with Christ, beloved, listen to me, was not an ad hoc uh, event after the matter. No, beloved, you listen to me. This was all done, the Bible says, according to the purpose of his own counsel and royal will. The Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, way back yonder, before they created anything, said this is what we're going to do when we create man. This is what we're going to do to those in the Beloved who come to my son Jesus. Would you say amen out there? So, Beloved, when your life seems chaotic, and you, uh, you can rest in the fact that Jesus is Lord and that God is still on the throne and he's in control of everything. I was praying this morning for what was going on in Ukraine. And I went on and on and on like I do normally every day. I'm sure most of you do. I didn't say all because I know Cheryl. <laughs> but God was nudging me saying, Joel, am I in control or not? I said, yes, Lord, but this is just this servant's plea for what's going on right now. Let peace prevail. Amen. Robert, think about it. A lot of 
what we would call innocent people are dying prematurely and going straight to hell. They went from war and hell on earth to hell forever and ever. Dying without Christ. That's serious business, isn't it? The only heaven they knew was the hell that they experienced on earth. And the same goes for every person on the top side of this earth. So God's purpose is save and sanctify us believers, beloved, and bequeath to us the spiritual riches of his kingdom. To bequeath to us eternal life, beloved, cannot be thwarted by any demon. It can't be thwarted by any devil or de uh, 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 anybody, beloved. No one can thwart God's plan. And that ought to give you confidence and hope. You ought to rejoice. You ought to glory in that. Amen? Knowing that you are in the bosom of the Father with the Son. Come on and say amen out there. So what are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying, oh, the infinite wonders of God's redemptive plan for you and me. So, beloved, I'm saying that's why you have been accepted in the Beloved. And that's why you have been elected in the Beloved. And that's why, and you can take this to the bank, you will ultimately someday be morally and spiritually perfected in the Beloved. Amen? This means that someday you will possess, someday you will procure, someday you will enjoy forever and eternity everything that God's heaven has promised us in the Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal kingdom of God. Now here's my last question to you. Are you sure that you are indeed one of those in the Beloved. We are not here by accident today. Folks watching by television are not by accident today. Those on YouTube are not by accident today. The providential hand of God has drawn you to this. Do you know for sure that you are one of those in the Beloved? You can be, Beloved, if you'll repent of your sin if you will believe the gospel, trust Christ as your Savior, and be baptized into Christ, then you will know for sure that you are one of those in the Beloved. Amen? That all of this pertains to you. No matter how tough life gets, no matter what happens to your physical body, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up for a dawn and a half later. I'll sing it to you about my truck. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet, those on the beloved, in the beloved, on higher ground. Come on and say amen out there. All right, let's go to the Father.